Jerry, Ian, thanks very much for joining us on a, a sad occasion as we talk about Stan Bowles. Everyone knew this day was going to come. He's obviously been unwell for, for some time, but coming to you first, Jerry, just how saddened were you by the news of Stan's passing? Yeah, very saddened. Uh, obviously, we knew the situation. We knew, you know, Stan was in a home, um, didn't recognise his family. Um, but um, for a couple of days after hearing about it, you know, you, I was just reminiscing about our times and reminiscing about the times with him. You know, must say, you know, on and off the field, we had a great time, a great laugh. And um, he was always so so much fun to be with, really, and to, to be around. Um, but a very sad day for everybody, and particularly his family. Condolences to his family. Um, you know, spent a lot of time looking after him uh, with a terrible illness, really. Um, but, um, yeah, very sad day. And Ian, for you, did you find the same that you were suddenly flooded with memories of Stan when you heard the news? Well, it comes straight back to you. The first thing you think about, the little rogue. You know, he, he was a character. He always, he always had something that was that happened to him or whatever. And you know, as as me and Jerry like are ex players, you miss all that. You know, he was a character, but he was a bubbly character, and uh, it'd be sadly missed. Why do you feel his legacy has lived on more than forty years after he last played for? QPR and also you have fans who never saw him play talk about him so fondly I think uh, I think personally I think he uh, he had this aura about him where people just loved him you know he, he, he could entertain he could entertain the crowd and also being when we used to play away I mean they used to give him hell of a lot of stick but he loved it I can remember the time when we, we were playing Newcastle uh, towards the end of that season. And uh, I know that he had a, a bet with uh, Malcolm McDonald, £500. And Stan, when Stan got the winner, I think there's a picture somewhere of him where he's jumping up in front of McDonald. And he knew it wasn't, it wasn't the winner, it was the, it was the 500 pound. But that's, that, that was Stan, you know, he was, a, he, was, he was a bubbly character, he was a good entertainer. Jerry, what are your first memories of Stan? He joined us in 1972, six months after Rodney Marsh had left us, signed by Gordon Jago. What were your first memories? Well, I think like Frank McClintock was saying, we did a radio interview the other day, and basically um, we didn't really know who Stan Bowles was um, from that point of view. He obviously got the sack at Man City. Uh, Malcolm Allison did that. Um, he went to, to Bury, to Crewe, to Carlisle, um, obviously in the lower levels. And uh, so, you know, when he first came, uh, we paid a record, I think, 100 odd, 112,000 or something. Um, and the training first day, I mean, you didn't really know who Stan was really from that point of view. Um, but then first day's training for me and him, uh, for some reason, we were just telepathic from the start. We just hit it off. Um, one twos, double one twos. And, um, you know, I remember talking to him afterwards and saying, well, you know, where have you been? You know, what you've been doing? I didn't realise, you know, it was a player that good in the, in the lower levels, you know. And he told me about Man City because obviously we, we knew nothing about that until... Obviously, he was transferred and his, his history came up in the papers. Um, and, you know, just from that day one, I think, you know, he's spoken about it as well. From day one, that first day of training, we just seemed to hit it off. Stan's quote was, Jerry Francis was the best thing for me. I'd only been at the club two days and we were doing one-twos and I thought, you'll do for me. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have many regrets in my career. Um, obviously, getting injured for three years after being captain of England and after our great, magnificent season, 75, 76. But my biggest regret was not playing for England with Stan. Although we played at the same time, I captain England, we never played together. And I think that was such a shame because I certainly could have helped him and um, he certainly would have helped me. But we didn't, we never played together, even though, you know, and Gilly played at the same time, Dave Thomas, um, you know, and uh, Phil Parks. Um, but we didn't play together. So that's the biggest regret really, because as a pair, uh, I think we meant so much to each other from that point of view. And Ian, when Stan joined, he of course took the number 10 shirt, which has previous, had previously been worn by Rodney Marsh. And he recalled at the time that people were saying to him, you're putting pressure on yourself by taking that number. Do you recall that? And almost did you admire the fact that he came in, I'll have that shirt and I'll kick on? No, I think I think he, he admired it. I think that he wanted to, he wanted to prove people 
you know, wrong, that he could could do it. And he certainly did. But, um, you know, it was just a, a situation where, as what Jerry was saying, I mean, they, we used to, when we used to finish training, they used to be practising out there with their one-twos one and, and everything. I mean, they had it just like that. I mean, the, the best, best examples when we played Liverpool at home, first game of the season. We scored a, Jerry scored a fantastic goal, but stands there. They knew exactly what they were doing and it, 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 it paid off. On the pitch, you had an incredible understanding. Yeah. What was it like off the pitch? Because as much as talked about Stan off the pitch as it is on it. Yeah, I, I mean, that was, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say Stan was at home on the pitch. That was what is at his best. That's, that was when um, he enjoyed himself, and that was that was his greatest situation. Put him on the pitch, and that 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 was that was that was his whole heart situation for him. You know, off the field was a mixture of uh, obviously laughing and obviously a lot of pressure at times for him in terms of you know maybe owing money or you know, problems from bookies or whatever it might be. But he seemed to be able to put that all to one side and just go out on that pitch and play. Uh, and that was an incredible situation. I mean, you know, Stan notoriously, you know, used to go to the bookies before he, he came into the dressing room and things like that, you know, and obviously managers didn't like that. I mean, I've been a manager afterwards, it wouldn't be easy, but I can remember as captain talking to Dave, you know, knowing Stan, Dave Sexton and saying, look, look, Dave, um, you know, just let him do it, I said, because, you know, sitting in this dressing room, he hates it, he can't sit still, he's up and down, he's all over the place. I said, look, let him go and do it. It's not a problem as long as he's doing it on the pitch. I said, and think about it. I said, you know, if he goes to the betting shop and he wins, he's going to come out and get a hat-trick because he's celebrating. If he goes to the betting shop and he loses, he's going to go and get a hat-trick because he needs a bonus, the win bonus. And that was Dan. And, and so just, just leaving, he wasn't really into tactics. He hardly ever warmed up, Gilly, did he? Never. Never warmed up, no. he hardly ever got injured. Um, you just no. get him out there and play. And he, he played off the cuff, but he had such a great football brain. And that's what real football yeah. was all about, really. It's about your ability to, to think on the pitch. And Ian, as teammates, was that the, the overriding view? Let Stan do what Stan wants to do. Because yeah, I think we so. We knew him. what Stan was like. We knew that he got himself into trouble with um, with money, etc. And uh, like with Slippery Jim, the chairman. I mean, he used to give him a few bob. But all the players knew that. It wasn't a problem, you know. It was Stan was Stan, and as what Jerry said, you just let him get on, get on with it. Um, it, it was just, um, it was just a one-off, and uh, and all the all the players accepted it. All the players, there was there wasn't one that you know, sort of got the ump about this and about that. We just just let him get on with it, and that's what he done. And you see how he used to celebrate goals and how you all celebrated with him. I get the impression, Gilly, that he was very popular with his teammates. Yeah, he was. He was. He, he was a lovable rogue. He was. He, he. He was a great man. You know. I mean, regardless on the other side of of, of not being playing, or as what Jerry said, you know, being outside in the real world, um, he, he he was a great character. And it's just a shame that things didn't didn't go right for him outside. Let's put it this way. I mean, if he he would have, he would have earned himself a right few quid if he wasn't a gambler, but that was Stan. I think that was a great team, though, Paul. You know, I mean, we we're talking about a great uh, uh, it was great camaraderie, really. I mean, basically, you're looking at a, a team that played a bit of total football, really. I mean, we all we all loved the Dutch of the seventies, Dave Sexton yeah. in particular. And, and we wanted to play like that. And Stan, you know, wasn't a big guy, Stan. And he played up front, you know, with people up, up behind him, centre-halves, etc., cetera, um, on muddy pitches that you couldn't move on, severe tackling, which is unbelievable tackling. You imagine what he could do now, being protected, better pitches, better fitness. Yeah. Um, and basically, you know, we played football. I mean, the goal against Liverpool that Ian's talking about, goal of the season, I mean, that could be Man City or Arsenal doing it now. Phil Parks is rolling it out to Frank McClintock, plays a little ball inside to Don Masson. He plays it up to Stan with Emily Hughes up his back trying to tackle him. He lets it run for his legs and flicks it to me. Emily Hughes don't know what day it is. Goes to me. I play a quick one-two into Don Givens, get it back. Goal. You know, within a minute, not Liverpool players touch the, touch the ball, we're one nil up. 
And I mean, that's how we played our football. And, and to be honest, it's a travesty. We didn't win it that year. And Stan was just a major part of cog of that of that team. Um, and 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 it was an outstanding team. So I think the fact that Stan's remembered all these years, not only because he played so many years for QPR and played at the top, he carried on playing for a long, long time, Stan. You know, whether it be at Brentford or wherever he went on from there, not in the forest for a little while. Couldn't understand him going to the forest with Cluffy personally. But, um, you know, and you still got video now that you can still people can still see him and see what it was like. I mean, when Messi came along, he reminded me so much of Stan. It was unbelievable. His movements, the way he twisted and turned, all left foot, you know, he'd turn in. You know, I'd play a ball up to him, go running past him. He'd do a little turn, little turn, little turn, and he'd flick it straight into my path. You know, and, and, and that was a great football brain. And, and he had this an unbelievable talent. And it's just a shame that perhaps his England career wasn't longer. He was at QPR for seven years. The pair of you were pretty much there for the entire seven year period, both of you. And he says during that seven years, he laughed every day. Yeah. And it's interesting that as soon as you two were together and while we were setting up here, you were reminiscing and, and both laughing about stories from that era. Is that how you remember it? Yeah, well, me and Gilly were there from 67, 68. We were yeah. came through the youth team together. Yeah. Um, so we were there. I mean, I, we both played with Rodney Marsh. We played with, obviously, with Stan. Um, so we were there for a long, long time. Saw the, saw the stands being built. You know, there weren't a stand when we started. It was a, you know, you had, a, you the had one shower and... over the urinal, yeah. wasn't it? You know, oh, you know. The, the shower would come yeah, on. Yeah, it was <laughs> terrible. You know, so that, that's how it used to be. Like, no no, no, uh, no grass on the pitch after a few months completely, oh, you know. It was absolutely diabolical. I remember I was great at painting the stands and yeah. he was going to sweep the terrace in. Yeah, <laughs> cleaning the toilets out. used to do all that, yeah. In those days, so yeah, we and then, but so to see the team, you know, as it did with Rodney Marsh, go from the third division, win the league cup '67, you know, go on to be into the first division as it was then. It's just that I think they'd come too quickly to that level. Uh, I made my debut that that that, that year uh, against Liverpool. Um, Gilly had already played then, um, and um, you know they they'd come a bit too far too quickly and obviously suffered and got relegated. And then obviously when Stan came in in 72, you know, Rodney going enabled us to buy Dave Thomas, Don Given, Stan Bowles, you know, and, and, and made the team better all round. What were the young players coming through? And, and we were a formidable side at that stage. You know, I mean, the two years before 75, 76, we were top London club for two years, you know. Um, so that showed for that period of time, it's just a shame instead of building it, and um, you know, buying more players. Obviously, it, it, we had the reverse situation happen where we were selling players, whether it's Phil Parks or Dave Thomas. And so, you know, that's difficult to maintain that success and sell players. What was he like as a trainer, Gilly? Stan, he was a good trainer. Good trainer. He was a good trainer. I mean, on a, on a um, on a Tuesday, we used to have Ron Jones, who used to be the um, a, a a sprinter, sprinter for yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, he was captain of England, and he used to take us on sessions. And we, we, we'd be working; all our work would be on like the, track. the scrubs, wouldn't it? Yeah, behind the scrubs. Yeah, yeah if he didn't run; he went yeah. in prison. Yeah, <laughs> and it was it was it, he was fantastic. Yeah, no, it was, yeah. it was it was nothing wrong with him. And I no. tell you what, he was he was a good trainer, and he was fit as well. The hardest thing was getting him there, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, no, he was a great trainer. I mean, he was he was a winner. That was the thing about him. He wanted to win. When he was out yeah. on that pitch, he wanted to win. You know, mm. and, and then you know, us, us as a team, we would we would you know carry on anything because he was a winner. He wanted to win. You know, and he worked hard off the ball. Um, and when he had the ball, you know, it was magic. So. Um, I mean, the prime example was when we was training um, at Greenford, and we we had a, a a little match. Dave Sexton he used to stay in the background a little bit. Sometimes he used to join in, and uh, Stan got the ball, and Frank McClintock he went yeah. steaming into him. And as he went steaming in, Stan got up quick, and he bit Frank's ear. <laughs> And all we could see was all this blood running down Frank's yeah, Frank's exactly. um, face, yeah. and but everything was forgotten about after ten minutes, wasn't it? it was, yeah. it was, you know, there was no matter. That was Stan. It's what Jerry said. He was a winner. He wanted to win things. Yeah. I mean, that is ultimate old school. There was no malice. He's bitten his ear, and there's blood running down the side. Oh of his yeah, face. yeah. But that was Stan. You know, he 
He used to he he, he used to take the mick out of, of some you know some of the opposition and all that. How they didn't give him a right hand, or I don't know. Did he do that in training? Obviously, you were a defender, so I'd imagine you came up against him in one on one scenarios. In yeah, training. thank God I wasn't in too much one v one <laughs> situations with him. Um, he was a very tri very tricky player, very clever. There's loads of banter at football clubs, you know, people winding yeah. people up. And yeah. We used to have major things with England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales in those days because of home international. So, um, yeah. you know, one minute you're teammates with Frank and Don Masson and all that, next minute you're playing yeah. in England, Scotland, and you, you're not you're not teammates. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there was so much banter at uh, in football clubs, you know, it's wind-ups and everything else, just part of the game as it is today. Did that bring the best out of Stan? He seemed to love having those almost one-on-one -on -one Jewels with Alan Ball as an example. Where... Yeah, Alan Ball, Malcolm McDonald, yeah, different things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, Ball, he was a wind up merchant, you know, anyway. Obviously, I played with him for England and everything else. He, he never stopped as a wind up. So, yeah, that, that went on all the time. There were people that, you know, you liked or people you didn't like too much. And obviously, you want to try and get the better of them. And obviously, you know, you're out there to win football games and, you know, try and win titles. So, um, everything's uh, competitive, you know. And, um, but, that was that was when he was so calm when he came onto the pitch. That was that's what he loved, you know. I think you could forget. It's amazing he could go from all of the problems he's got outside of or off the pitch, yeah. and just go on the pitch as if he hadn't got a worry in the world, you know. And and that's where he was at his happiest. That's what he enjoyed, and he'll always be remembered. You know, you've got the Stanley Bowles um, ground now stand. Um, I was there with Stan. Went out with Don Shanks, who's done a lot for him as well. His his uh, his, his pal. Um, his ex, um, you know, gambler with him. Um, and it was great to see him go around with his hands up, with his hat on. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, definitely knowing and hearing, you know, the crowd chanting his name, clapping him. And, um, you know, he got a lot worse just after that. But it was great to see him realise that, see that and see how much he was loved. So he'll, he'll always be remembered, I think. He's regarded as an incredible individual, but... I know you guys have also in the past said he was always a team player. He had that balance, didn't he? Yeah, he was a team yeah, player. I think he was more of a team player than an individual, yeah. to be honest, because I think he had individual skills and ability, mm. but he was he was a team player. He, he, he made so many you know, goals for me where probably he could have shot himself, you know, um, obviously vice versa in different situations. It's about football intelligence, making the right pass again, I think. And, um, but he had that individual ability that he could go past two or three people and score just like that. At the same time, if, if he pulled two or three players to him, he'd just pass it to someone else that was in a better position. That's, that's what you call football brains. Did it surprise you how he could leave his off-the-field challenges off the field and then produce performances like that? Yeah, I always talk to him about the future, um, you know, about, OK, Stan, you know, you know, you've got to put something away, get your pension or something like that. I always talk to him about things like that at different times because um, <clears throat> I thought it was important because... You could see that while he's in football and he's got his talent, uh, fine, you know, he's going he's gonna to be OK, he's going to be earning money. But what's going to happen, you know, football is a short, short career. You can't all go into management and coaching. And uh, it stops at still a very young age. You know, what's Stan going to do? Um, but he was just like, don't worry, Joe, you know, I'll, I'll get by, I'll do this, I'll do that. You know, don't worry. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and that, that's, that's how he was. I mean, if Stan had a tenner, and he had no money at all, perhaps he owed thousands. You know, and there was an old lady, he'd give her a fiver. He'd keep yeah, the fiver for a bet, would. but um, he'd give her a fiver. And that, that stand, that was stand, yeah. really. And yeah. um, I remember I saw a video just recently, because I've been watching a few lately that have come on. There's one where it said, if you came back today and, um, you know, I was talking to you as a young kid, you know, what would you tell yourself, you know, um, just starting again? And he said, well, nothing really. I had a great time, I did everything. I had seven great years, like you said, laughing all the time at QPR. And, and so he, he was happy in himself, I suppose. Is that how you remember in that generosity? Oh, he was, he, yeah, he was very generous. Yeah, it was what Jerry said, you know, you know, he'd always buy someone a drink or, you know, if a, you go into um, Frank Bennett's at the Target, you go in there yeah, and he'd the always, they would always be, even the, even the uh, workers, the paddies, they used to come in and get a drink out of him. So he was that type of type of person, you know, he, and they loved him. It's as simple as that. They just loved him. 
He worked under several different managers during his time at QPR, Gordon Jago, Dave Sexton, Frank Sibley, Alex Dock, and latterly Steve Burtonshaw and, and Tommy Doherty. Um, who got the best out of him and how do you think they achieved it? I think you have to give Gordon Jago a lot of credit because, yeah. um, you know, he was, he, Gordon wasn't the greatest coach, that wasn't his forte, but he was a great man manager. Yeah, he was. And he, he had Bobby Campbell come in there that was a good coach and could wind people up. Um, but, you know, him getting a lot of that side together with Stan and, you know, uh, Ty, uh, sorry, Dave Thomas and um, Don Gibbons, you know, um, he had a lot to do with that team eventually becoming a 75, 76 one. What Dave did, um, who obviously was, you know, a very, very good coach and somebody I worked with again at Coventry, um, he just took us on another two or three notches in terms of yeah. rotation, in terms of, um, you know, um, playing the ball like the Dutch, um, you know, not always having a centre forward in, in that area. You know, Stan would come off and play in midfield. I would then go into that forward position. So um, the rotation we had, um, you know, Dave brought that in really and uh, it just made us, you know, go up four or five notches, you know, from a team that was top London club and close to a team that, you know, probably should have won the league really. And he got the best out of Stan by allowing Stan to be Stan. Yeah, he had, he had his differences. I mean, you know, Stan yeah, was out the side a little bit. He was asked for transfer, didn't he? He was yeah, left out the side. Yeah. I remember I had to go play up front a few times yeah. when Stan was out. And, um, you know, I just wanted Stan in the team. So, but obviously, you know, you have to have rules and regulations at the football clubs. And Stan, uh, Stan asked for a transfer a few times because he knows that Jim was giving him a few quid Jim to sort of come quid. off the transfer well, Of course list, he did. I mean, we know all the... We know that. ...different yeah. deals yeah. and things, you know, I mean... I mean, I remember I was having some photographs down at the time with my girlfriends at different times. And Stan was saying, how much you get for those photographs? And, uh, and whatever he's talking, and, he, and then all of a sudden he's done one and caused all sorts of problems with Dave, I think, because uh, yeah. uh, he, he's married, you know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was never dull with Stan. You know, you'd pick the paper up in the, in, in the morning and just say, well, what's Stan up to it today? We'll see. Yeah. But, um, you know, um, in terms of a player, um, you know, excellent. There's been an incredible outpouring of love for Stan, like we said earlier, from people that played with him, saw him play, never saw him play. Does that give you guys some comfort seeing just how idolised he is by different generations? I think so, personally, don't you? Yeah. I, mean, I think especially the youngsters now, if they could actually see see a video of him actually playing and and they could learn from that because, as we said before, he was a one-off. He was a character. He, he enjoyed his football. Now, me personally, I think they're just a load of robots. And all right, they get paid big bucks. But when you've got a character like him, it, it's, it, it was great. And I think kids in general, they would learn a lot off of him. Well, and this man here. So... You know, that, that that would be a good thing for football. I think it's good that they, that you, they can go online and see videos. Yeah, um, I mean, I What do. is it, 45 years ago now? Yeah. Um, so I think that's great. They've still got the videos and you can see, you know, what it was and what it was yeah. as a player. As I say, in times where pitches were dreadful. And, yeah, and, and the, the muddy tackling, pitches. tackling was ferocious. You yeah. know, I mean, you really had to look after yourself in those days. Um, so imagine what he would be as a player now with those yeah. skills, being protected, you know, can't tackle from behind, you know, can't do this. Fantastic pitches, you know, better yeah. fitness levels if you yeah. can get him to do it, um, <laughs> you know. And um, But, yeah, I mean, as I say, you know, a lot of the top players, Bestie and, and people like that through that era, what you know, they talk about, can they play today? What would they be like today? You'd, you'd be so much better because you've got more protection, you've got better pitches, you yeah. know, you've got more room to show your skills because people are not just kicking straight through you. Um, so these players with those abilities, they would be, you know, ten times what they were then. Now I think. What would a Stanley Bells be worth in today's market? It's impossible to say, isn't it? I mean, I mean, you know, I think that um, the one thing I was pleased about for Stan, because obviously he could have gone the other way when he got the sack at Man City under Malcolm Allison. You know, I played under Malcolm, and obviously he was a talented coach. Um, it was obviously the people he was seeing, the things he was doing, not turning up for training. Yeah. But I think the guy at Crew, I can't remember his name, the manager, he always said that he really put him back on track in terms of, you know, making him see that you have got so much talent, Stan, you're just going to waste it and do nothing. Or you can give yourself a, have a real go. 
and uh, he was able to get back on track, climb the leagues, eventually come to QPR, and then show people over. You know, played five, six hundred games in his stand, so he, you know he kept going. Um, mm. What a talent he was, and it could have been so different. So I think in many ways he was very lucky because that was his love, that was where he was most happy on that football pitch, and he managed to do that. Mm. The club will be paying tribute to Stan on Wednesday evening when we host West Bromwich Albion. You're both aiming to be there. Will that be an emotional occasion for you guys? Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, yes, it definitely will be. Be emotional because he, he's gone and, you know, he, 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 was, he was a loved guy. And, you know, you miss miss people that you, that you liked yeah. and you miss people that that you, you want to see that got got on and he got on and uh, and he will be sadly missed. It will be for the club, won't it? I mean, um, yeah. it's like just a couple of things. Terry Venables was, um, you know, lost just recently as well. You know, who, yeah. uh, you know we both played for and, mm. you know, I had, I had a lot of time. He was like a father figure to me. So, you know, th there are a number of players just recently that, um, you know, we've been involved with and um, that have, you know, have passed on. But... Um, Certainly, from uh, QPR's point of view, um, with Stan and knowing, you know, he was diagnosed at what sixty six. I think he was sixty six years of age when he was diagnosed. Uh, you know, mm. it's been a it's, a it's a terrible, terrible illness, terrible for the family, obviously terrible for him. Um, so yeah, I, 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 it will be a very, very sad day for the club. I think. Just finally, what will be your abiding memory of Stan Bowles? My abiding memory, seeing him scoring and having a laugh with the fans turning round to them that was that would that would be be my my one yeah i remember him as he was really you know that, that's all you picture really i don't yeah. want to picture him as i saw him last or, yeah. or or you know what i saw a video of him in the home kicking the ball about um your, your lasting memory wants to be seeing him in his prime yeah. probably the picture that Ian was talking about uh, up at St James's Park when he scored the winner in the last minute and Malcolm McDonald standing there, they've had that bet and they row all the time and he's jumping up in the air at him and he's he's laughing at him and uh, mm. I think probably that that would be all Definitely. of Stan really, yeah. cheeky, impish, great talent because he just scored the winning goal and, and um, you know, <laughs> giving it to somebody at the same time as well because that, that was Stan really. That yeah. photo encapsulates yeah. Stan Bowles. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. Absolutely.